this time I would like to ask Commissioner Brian Booth if he would say the invocation. Before we begin, I'd like to also remind everyone, including myself, to turn your cell phones on silent or, uh, on, silent or on vibrate so we don't uh, interrupt this meeting. This meeting's not going to last very long, uh, but we do have a couple of important matters to attend to. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, dear Lord, Lord, watch over this court, dear Lord, that we do everything that's betterment for this county, dear Heavenly Father, and, and go with us, dear Lord, throughout the remainder of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Judge Jones. Present. Commissioner Robertson. Here. Commissioner Tackett. Here. Commissioner Booth. Here. We have a quorum. We are ready to proceed. I'd like to ask Belfry Fire Chief uh, and future Pike County uh, Emergency Management Director, Nee Jackson, if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. First item on the agenda is the acknowledgement of the receipt of the Pike County Public Library District's budget for fiscal year 2022. And I'd like to ask Luella Allen, uh, who is the director of the Pike County Public Library District, to come up uh, to the table, please. And pull those mics up close and make sure the little green light's on. Roy can help you there, Luella. So if you all would, just for the purpose of the public who uh, may be tuning in, uh, please state your name and your position, please. Luella Allen, Director of Libraries. Okay. And would you please state your name? Uh, Delina Atkins, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Pike okay. County Libraries. Well, welcome. We received the budget, but we've got several questions that we would like to address uh, through the, uh, the uh, with regard to the library budget, as well as some operational issues. Um, the first issue is uh, I did not see on the budget that there was any statement of cash on hand. Special districts, as you know, whenever you were in the state legislature, they went uh, an overhaul of all the procedures, and they don't have to be included on the operational budget. They are reported as when they're reserved as, as reserve funds for the different liabilities, as we've discussed before, and so that's why it's not on the operational budget okay. because it is set well, into reserves. I'm aware. And you might want to switch microphones. Is that me or is that Luella doing that? It may be. Luella, why don't we switch microphones, because that one's sort of acting up a little bit. Um, one of the issues that, and I'm aware of the fact that, that you don't have to state everything on the budget, but I noticed that you had listed $4,000 in interest as other income. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you tell me what the balance on all your other accounts are right now, any reserve accounts or savings accounts? The reserve accounts for the retirement is $2,221,000. The Virgie donation reserve for their remodel is 205000 The employee benefits that would uh, has to be accrued each time over the years is 300000 The um, special project of remodeling that is anticipated is 250000 So that's all the cash you have on hand? No, the operational. Um, as you know, Pike County is unique. We don't get our taxes out on time. They don't usually come out for, we don't receive them for eight months into the fiscal year. So as a special taxing district, we have to maintain those levels in there. So for eight months at 300,000 a month is 2,400,000 that's in set there as well. Then there is a rainy day fund for, um, 224,000, which is 62.4 days of um, operations. So what, what's the total cash on hand for everything right now? Um, $2 million, I mean, excuse me, $6 million. So you're sitting there right now with $6 million? We're not sitting there, it's required. Whenever you have a liability that's on your financial statement, 
Um, we have the retirement has to be recognized. And as you know, whenever you have uh, bond, fund, bond ratings, if you have excess liabilities, it lowers your rating. Um, so the other thing is, is whenever this is addressed in the state legislature, there is a possibility that we could purchase our retirement liability and be able to withdraw from the retirement fund. And that money is set there for that purpose. Yeah, the interesting thing with what you're, the, what you're saying is no other quasi-governmental entities or governmental entities have enough cash to set aside money for their uh, contingent liabilities for future pension costs. Look, the health department doesn't, do they, Reggie? No. Fiscal court doesn't. Uh, um, that's interesting because whenever you brought that up to me previously, I went back and pulled the um, budgets and the financial statements on the special districts. I was wanting to make sure that we weren't doing something that was inappropriate. And if you go back and look at those, um, you'll find that percentage-wise that they do have. Well, Reggie is on the health department board. I, I, I don't know of any districts. Mountain Water District doesn't have the cash on hand. Fiscal Court doesn't have it. The teacher retirement in Frankfurt doesn't have it. We all know that the state retirement system doesn't have it. And the question becomes, um, you know, we, we have this issue, Luell, that is always, it's never set right with me that how much was spent on the new library? Do you know what that was? Mm, 10800000 I think it was. 10800000 I think that's what the contracts were. Okay. Were there any change orders with that or anything over top of that? That was with the exchange orders. So there, so you all spent, was that paid for up front? No, we, re, we did save a lot of the money uh, over the 30 years that it was been planned. It was saved over the period of time, and we had six or six or eight million. Anyway, when the contracts came in, it was so large, it was cut back. We had gotten the bond to cover the project, and then when it came through, it was changed and was cut back dramatically. So it was I'm cut trying to back. remember exactly when we when we paid them off, when we took the, all the reserves and paid them off. So, so essentially what I'm saying is you spent $10.8 million on the library and it's paid off? Yes. Okay. And, and, you know, when I represented Martin County, there was an issue where my buddies over in Martin County, and this has been a sore subject with a lot of their folks, they spent about 10 or $12 million on a new courthouse that they really can't debt serve. And I just, you know, I, when that library was built, I did have some co concern over it because declining population, declining tax base, and, you know, it was the same thing with the county. You're building infrastructure that you're going to have to worry about maintaining in perpetuity. Um, I also have concern over this issue that we approached the uh, library district over the uh, University of Pikeville. And as I don't think I have to tell you or anyone else in this community how many people are out of work. The one area that we have that's growing, the one segment of our economy is health care. There's a tremendous need at Tug Valley ARH. Pikeville Medical Center, uh, Our Lady of the Way, Highlands, Whitesburg, every hospital around needs nurses. And just looking around this room, Reggie's wife is a nurse, good paying job. Ronnie's wife and daughter are nurses, high paying jobs. Nee Jackson's wife is a nurse, high paying job. Greg Fannin's daughter, uh, nurse, high paying job. Fabian Little's daughter, nurse, high paying job. It's the one area that we have that's growing where we can put people to work. And I mentioned the other day in the court meeting, and I'm sure you've, you saw this, my dad was in the hospital. One of the nurses that was taking care of him was a, a gentleman who was a coal miner that lost his job, went back to nursing school. And when I approached uh, the, the, the library board at the request of the University of Pikeville, as you know, they're landlocked. They have no more room to grow. And their position is if they had the space, they could triple the size of the nursing program. They received a $2.3 million donation for someone who has some ties to this community that don't live here anymore. They spent $2.3 million that was donated to the university from someone that doesn't live in our community that cares enough 
to try to help that university in the mission that it's trying to fulfill. They need additional space. And when they went to the library board, the library board said, we're not interested. No, that wasn't exactly the word. Well, that was exactly the, the words that, that, that we were that pretty much verbatim. We can't do it. We're not going to do it. We, you know, whatever. Excuse me. I'm in for the library. What the was was I can't quote it exactly after very careful review. We cannot sell the taxpayer and the the with the legal issues as well as the financing for that library. We are unable to sell that library. Whose opinion was that? That was the research of the attorneys as well as um, the board going through that. What, who were the attorneys? One of them was Joe Justice and the other was we consulted with um, Frankfurt. Who did you consult with in Frankfurt? Um, with the Kentucky Department of Libraries and Archives. Okay, so you, I would like to see the documents that were relied upon because any public entity can sell or lease a facility. We have sold properties. There are statutes on that about the procedure that you have to go through. I just think that we need to see the documents that, that were relied upon so that we can get our own opinion. But, you know, as hard as this court has worked, as hard as the city of Pikeville has worked, to try to help stop the population loss. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got three children. My kids are likely never to be able to stay here and make a living unless something changes. He's got three daughters. Two of them are, are out of state. One's in Chicago, one's in Texas, or in, uh, in Massachusetts. You can look around Eastern Kentucky. And so many people have had family members that have had to leave to find work. And we get one bright spot, and the library board is basically an impediment to that. So I'm not going to leave this issue to rest. Nobody has supported libraries any more than I have. You can look at my record in Frankfurt. I truly value libraries, but when a library district becomes more important than the community that it serves, I have a problem with that, and I think that's the situation we're in. And, and hang on a second, Luella. I really am upset about this. We have worked so hard to try to find ways to put people to work. We could fill 150 nursing jobs, and it's not funny, Luella. I mean, that's funny, but my family as the ones that you're talking about who's been employed there, well, has gone through the university. They have become doctors. They have become nurses. They were in the graduating class that just happened. They were just hired. And I graduated from there. I, every day, I'm very uh, grateful there are for the impact There's that, that college has had on my family alone as well as my community. Well, then you should be wanting to stand up and find a way to help because there's 150 nursing shortage, 150 nurse shortage at the university or at the Pifle Medical Center alone right now. And this is a, there's a patient care issue. Yes, it is. Which I experienced, I, I'm familiar with this through my other hat I wear. It's a, there's, a, there's a nursing shortage and that has implications for every patient in every hospital in Eastern Kentucky. So I would like Mr. Justice to bring, come up and give us a, a legal explanation as to why this can't be done. Because we're going to look at other op options here. And I mean, I'm going to have the county attorney look at the option of whether we can condemn it for a public purpose. I'm going to look at the option, and I've already consulted with several members of the legislative delegation. The one, the one entity that we basically, the taxpayers that are watching this, have no control over is the library district. Because we don't get to, con we have no control over who goes on the board. We get two names submitted to us. The taxpayers, you, you, your board can set tax rates, levy taxes on every property owner in this county, and the people that you're levying taxes on have no control over the district. There's no oversight. And I think that's something that needs to be looked at, and I've consulted with, uh, with at least one high-ranking Republican legislature, legislator in the Senate, and I suspect there's going to be legislation filed. This is something that needs to be done. If I appoint a board, this court confirms them, it doesn't do the right thing. The public can hold us accountable every four years. There's no accountability with the library board. And there's some fine people we've put on the library board. That's not exactly true because the state exercises great oversight of us. We report constantly as well as to this, this court. And the DLG is where the, all the special entities are reported at. 
each all, time. All the DLGs looking at, Louella, is are you balancing your budget? Are there any financial improprieties? And no one's ever said that. But as far as how the money's spent, Frankfurt doesn't oversee that. The decisions that are made, Frankfurt doesn't. The ELA does. No one oversees those decisions who is accountable to the voters. And I think that's a problem. I think it's a huge problem. You know, Mountain Water District supported by the fiscal court. People don't agree with that, then they can, they can come to the fiscal court. No one has any accountability here. And I do question Mr. Justice's legal opinion because Roy Downey's looked at this issue. I've looked at this issue. Um, you know, I think it's short-sighted. I think we need to try to work together as a community. I'm not going to be county judge forever. I don't intend to. But I hope that when I leave, that when this court leaves, that our community's better off, that people can find work and stay here. Because the library district's not going to succeed if people aren't working here, if there's not work people here to pay taxes. You know, the university is the one, I mean, one of the few bright spots we have, and they're landlocked. Um, I think we need to back up on something. You were at the meeting where we, you call, asked for us to meet with the University of Pikeville. A long discussion was held about what their plans were and everything and where they saw their future being. Um, you didn't continue with us on the meeting down to where we toured the building. The $2.3 million was very well spent on the mobile equipment for their labs and they had set it up on the third floor which was um, second floor th oh, third floor which was very impressive and one of the things they explained to us was to be able to pull those mobile labs out and move them to somewhere else as a matter of fact they were going to move them the next month as soon as the third floor got finished um, they were as you said we were trying to add a lot of different um, a lot more students to that program. Um, as it turned out, they didn't get that approval. They only got a fraction of what they requested. The, um, the governor came with the provost and met with their library board and discussed all of this with them as well. And he pointed out that the city of Pikeville um, was a very good partner with them and their lease agreements were one dollar a year um, that being part of what they were saying they were doing there was multiple buildings discussed that they were looking at on their expansion as well as they've acquired a lot of property on top of the hill for the new expansions that they're going to have um, the library yes it's convenient for them and it is located that a lot of the properties that they have looked at in the city of Pikeville are private entities, as well as the college is a private entity. It's not a, a governmental entity. So they have looked at other ones and they have a expansion plan that they have in place. What they were looking at was for a temporary situation and with them not getting the approval is a mute issue now. Well, it's not, it's not moot. I had a meeting uh, two days ago with Terry Dotson, who is the chairman of the board. The, and he again reiterated to me, and let me just explain who Terry Dotson is. Terry I Dotson. I know Terry very well. Well, Terry's a graduate of Feds Creek High School. He okay. is the owner of Worldwide Equipment that employs 1,100 people. Yes. He doesn't live here any longer. He, his business has been relocated, but he still puts a lot of money into the economy here. He puts a lot of money into that university. He spends a tremendous amount of time to help the University of Pipeline. And I think they've got some other plans that they're getting ready to announce. As recently as two days ago, Mr. Dotson was again reiterating to me how much they need that building. So it is not a moot issue. This past week, I had a conversation with Lori Worth, who is the provost, who again was reiterating to me how much the university needs this building. And the and, taxpayers need this building. Well, the taxpayers, the taxpayers have taxpayers access. Because the taxpayers have planned this building the, for over 50 years. The taxpayers and have. this a, took place a 12, 20 years ago, whenever it took place, the library, whenever the funding came through and the donations came through, the library was required to give that other half to them 
for us to have this half that we have, the little small portion well, that the city well, of Pikeville all, had years already ago. started building. So, and from that standpoint, they have received half of it, and the taxpayers have invested into this and with the money that had been saved over the years, the taxpayers have invested into this facility for 50 years. Well, let me say so, this. And the, when they plan libraries. The taxpayers put 10 and a half, or almost $11 million in a library down here, three or four miles away. It's just, it's the same thing the fiscal court did for years, duplication of services. And the whenever it came the that we needed to do the expansion the Luella, for that library down there, the university, we, we asked the university to buy their share out so that we did not have to do that. The university offered to make available, and their, their library is open to the public. People could, instead of going up here, they could go right to the university library for the same service, take an elevator right up to it. It's not like the people would not have access to service. The simple fact of the matter is things have changed over the last 50 years. There's no longer thousands of coal mining and coal related jobs here. And as hard as we're working to try to make sure there's a future here, one positive, one thing that we could do to put hundreds of people to work over the next few years, the library board says no. So it's not a moot issue. I would like for you to, to provide to us all of the account balances, copies of what you have. I think we're entitled to that either. If we, we need to submit an open records request, we can do that. And I'd like to see the documents that Mr. Justice is relying on. And I fully intend uh, to uh, have legislation introduced to address how, we, how, we, how our libraries are operated. I mean, things change. Things are not the same as they were. And libraries have grown from the beginning of times. Libraries have to continuously, just as you all have to, as things change, you have to be in tune to your community and you have to try to provide the different resources. That is, a, as you said, it's a landlocked area. It is not something that we could ever try to replace in any portion of the city of Pikeville. The, and the largest concentration of population is in that area and it is located between the different colleges with which we do serve. Do, and do you, do you know from what? the standpoint of the college serving our public, there's a, several different things is their accreditation versus what a public library is. Then whenever you get into their databases and the cost for their databases, it's based on the usage. So it goes from a 2,000 students to 60, uh, 58,000 population. In, in 58,000 people aren't going to use their, that database. I'm sorry. 58,000 people aren't going to use the database. But that's so what, whenever the database people are setting their prices, well, that's, whenever you're negotiating but the university's those. Willing to, the university's willing to do that, Luella. Well, they've made that clear. And the thing that bothers me is I, I've got a copy of this, and if the press would like a copy of it, this is the University of Pikeville's budget for 21 and 20, 2021 and 2021-22. Uh, you want to take a guess how much money the University of Pikeville is pumping into the economy in Pikeville and Pike County? How much? $60 million a year. Mm -hmm. That doesn't count money that students are spending on food and rent and gas and spending in stores or getting haircuts or getting their car worked on. It's, it's, it's well over $100 million, easily over $100 million that that university is putting into this community. <laughs> And we have an opportunity to help them increase that. And the library board is single-handedly saying, can't do it, can't do it. I don't believe that's the case, and we'd like to see those documents. As far as um, we're not part of the management of University of Pikeville, and as far as we being the libraries is a very narrow function of what we're supposed to do in support of each of the other special districts and the county government. As you are restricted, you can't give anything that, you have, that the county owns to a private entity. Nobody's asking you to do that. That's, not, nobody, that's never been discussed. And if you have fundings and contributions that, was, that you had taken to build a facility and it has restrictions on it that it has to be a public library, that is a loss to the public. And I guess the thing that really keeps being lost is we're, n we're not the only piece of property and we're not the 
the expansion. You know, it's a, it's a they billion, tried to buy the News a, Express. Mr. Um, Vanderbeck told us during one of his meetings 14 years ago. The rumor is they still, that's an entire block at the foot of the hill. The University of Pikeville is buying the top of the hill right now for their expansion. It's in the court records. Where's the nursing school at? The nursing school is a mobile facility in which they have told us that they're moving to the medical building as soon as they get everything in place. They're, they're, they're Plus nursing. there's two other floors on that building. The bottom floor is uh, Pike TV and the TV media center of which would be better served in say the theater where they could pay one dollar a year rent as, or um, in one of the offices of the county government since the city and the county the building have, the, been, uh, have the, the U Pike. The building attached it actually shares elevators and a front door. I'm sorry, could you say again? The please? building that, that the library has is attached to the same building that they've invested millions of dollars in for their nursing lab and other, the nursing facility. Which is all mobile. No, it's, well, they may be able to move it, but the building that it's been spent, it's, it's in, is a $2.3 million investment. That no, was put they didn't in spend it on the building. If you had been with that spent, part of the meeting that you told it that was, you were at, I have been there, Luell. It's a, it's the equipment that was put in. Obviously, the equipment costs money. The equipment was two over two point three million I, from what they what had told us. They put that came from a donor, and I'm not going to argue this with you, but I also am not inclined to approve your budget either. Okay. I mean, the only I thing you have to do is we have to submit it to you for acknowledgement, and you have acknowledged that you've received it. Well, the, the it has been fact. filed with the Department of Local Government back in May, and it was submitted to you all on May the 27th. Well, the simple fact of the matter is you could help the university. There's a way this could be done. They need that facility, and it would have a direct, immediate impact on this economy. And the library has an immediate and future impact on the economy from the standpoint of the service that it has for people. This is and one, you are the prime is, example how of how many times have I heard you in the multiple meetings I've been with you about the benefit you had of walking across the street to your library. That's correct. And that's what I want to give to all of the other people is in that Luella, same There's a library right down the street that will be available, not even, not even an eighth of a mile away. The university has offered to make that available. You have, it would only affect one building, not even your biggest public library, obviously. One building. And the library has spent a lot of money. How much, I think 450,000 was spent, was, what was the price of the parking lot? Did you buy some additional property behind the, the, the new library? Yes. How, how much did that cost? That was four, 410,000. 410,000. That was part of the original purchase, yes. Okay, and then there's another piece of property. Is that in addition to the 10.8 million? Yes. Okay, so you're up to 11.3 million roughly mm -hmm. uh, on that library. That's just a short distance down the road. And then you've got um, another piece of property you bought somewhere else. Was it up around Millard or somewhere it's for storage? Yes, we have to have some place to Justice. put the equipment that when we go mow the grass and. When we have to work on, we make a lot of our own furniture and do um, our own repairs and things. So, yes, we bought a facility that we could do paint, welding, carpentry, things of that nature. Yes. I mean, so you understand that you have to have some infrastructure to do your job. Yes, infrastructure is very important in and libraries. The and the university, are one and very the, important for and the, the university economy cannot, and to attract any businesses to come in. The university cannot provide the maximum level of service it could provide without the cooperation of the library board. They could restructure what they have and the service it, or there's the expo center setting with open doors. There's, there has multiple buildings that are here in the so you city think they can, you They're think, looking for a temporary solution until they get so the structure that So you think that, that they can locate on, a nursing there school? Are other places that cost them one dollar you think a they could locate so you're you're telling the people of this community that they could take the expo center and put a nursing school in it when you're looking at the the structures that is a temporary classroom yes when you got tables and things of what the instruction is and when they provided us with um, a sketch of what they wanted to do the nurse the uh, nursing program was listed in the children's area 
And for that small of an area, they already have that on the other side. So you, and for right now, for what that meeting was and all what they talked about is a temporary one year or two years until they get their other projects started. And you want the taxpayers to give up something they've worked I'm not 50, asking the taxpayers 50 to give years that of trying to get and years. pull pennies together to pay for. That, that building's not been there for And give up a permanent years. future of that, that building is expected that not been for there. 100 years. Louisville, I know how much I pay in taxes. Yes. A lot of people pay a lot of taxes to the library district that don't feel that they get the benefit out of it. It serves a very limited number of people. It's one facility, one facility, and things have changed. And I can promise you this, if something don't, if there's not a change in our economy here, nothing's gonna be sustained. Not yep. the hospital, not the university, not a single business here. There's not a single business in Eastern Kentucky that has grown to speak of in the last three or four or five years because of the loss of coal jobs except health care and you have an opportunity as a member you need of to come to lowe's then you need to look out my window within at lowe's well, why well, is this as the I, trucks I have, are pulling I, out I don't with have all time, of that i don't have time during the day to i don't either to, but, but you just need to see it well I, I i can't comment about lowe's okay but i can tell you most of the folks working at lowe's they're not the same level of pay that somebody that goes to nursing school like his daughter his daughter his daughter and just like my family that just got hired and they didn't get hired at the wages that you said well i can tell you i can tell meeting. you i can tell you that there's one there's two people sitting here who's who uh whose wives have very high paid nursing jobs and there's two others whose daughters have i, I don't know i can tell you this much tug valley's paying up to 30 dollars an hour starting out for nurses so if you want a 2,000 hour uh, a year uh, work schedule you can do the math on that 60,000 plus benefits we could help grow our health care economy here. I'm a firm believer in the University of Pikeville and donator and, and things of that nature. I, the hospital, they've done wonders with me. I just utilized their services dramatically for two, year, two months. Um, our community needs to join together, everyone. And as far as contributions, all these people, you can make contributions to the each facility and get a tax deduction for it, which is 100 percent. That doesn't help them get a, that doesn't help them with their infrastructure needs. The library can do that and the library could put people to work. They could take young people, help them get an education and help them get a job within two years. There are very few classes, curriculums that you can go to school for two years and get a 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar year job coming out of school. It just doesn't happen. And I think it's short-sighted, and we're going to look at all the options to address this. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you going to address the appointment to our board today? Uh, I had planned on uh, doing that here momentarily. Okay. Uh, it would be my motion to reappoint Carolyn Tackett to serve on the board uh, with a term that would expire 831-21. The new term will begin 831-21 and end on... 831 2025 is there a motion motion we have a motion by commissioner tackett is there a second 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 by commissioner robertson is there any question or discussion on this appointment or on this issue seeing none madam clerk please call the roll commissioner robertson yes commissioner tackett yes commissioner booth yes judge jones thank you all very much thank you for your time So the next item, Mr. Little, would you like to come up and address the uh, mowing issue? Mr. Little, thank you very much. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Just so the public understands, what is the budget for the road department a year? Oh. Not a trick question. It's around, what, $7 million? Yeah. $7 million. So that's to operate 
the road department take care of a thousand miles of county roads for an entire year pay your Black employees. Top, gravel drainage uh, everything yeah which is about what they've got in cash reserves over at the library district i'm just trying to put that in perspective um how's the new mower doing the mower's doing good i actually uh i've talked to the operator this morning and uh he, he really likes the machine it's doing a great job okay would you have a recommendation about acquiring uh similar mowers i would i mean uh, but there is a look like the mr fannin had told me this morning and uh, actually dare from cmi had sent me a message also um, he's saying that if we ordered the mower it would be probably middle of july to second or third week of july before we would get them i talked to him right before i came in and uh he said that uh, they were supposed he thought that they'd already had those two mowers ordered and thought that they would be be there and available this week and they're not going to be well i don't think we can go anywhere and pick pull them out of the sky either so no that's what i was saying he he wouldn't he wouldn't nail down a date for me but he said he thought probably between the second and third week of july was when they would be available are there anything else on the market greg or we look anywhere else i called mead equipment yesterday they're a big john deere dealer he told me they're very hard to find. He suggested that if you're going to have a mower in March of April of 2022, his advice would be order the mower today. He, why, why the short? Hey, you just can't get them. I mean, I don't know. He he was supposed to send me an email. He's not sent it yet on some of it, but he, he told me that uh, some of the mowing decks is 10 months out that far I'd, I'd say judge it's just over the pandemic they, a lot of people wasn't working put people off and people's ordering them i mean he said people are right now ordering for 2022. So. cmi though has the they they have the the alamo they have the deck it was just the tractor the way yeah. well he said he said that we need to order. yeah I, yeah yes, he yeah. said if you motion to order two more motion second let me see <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad example for my young son you get that lisa <laughs> and always wait till the motion stays <laughs> afraid it might get away oh is there a motion to purchase practice for a contract for 59973 for motion okay we have a motion by commissioner booth is there a second 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 by commissioner take and these are a little bit more expensive than the ones that we had ordered but i think they're bigger tractors they'll probably be able to cut more get the job it's a bigger cutting deck and a longer boom yeah so and you think we're going to be good with these yeah i do I never, when we started down this path back last December and bought them in February, I would never have imagined that we couldn't get tractors. I mean, I just. Nah. I had this conversation with Fabian. I, what, those tractors we ordered from Wright, Greg, wasn't them 5,000 M series? Yeah, 59 M. The, the guy, when I talked to him yesterday at Mead Tractor, the first thing he told me was, he said, if you're ordering an M in the 5,000 series, don't put a boom on it, they won't hold up. So this might have been a blessing this happened because we could have had issues because if me tractor as big as they are says that you can't run a boom on a m5000 series or he wouldn't recommend it well what mr little found out from cmi the other tractors that we had that were auctioned off and we looked at putting booms on those and they would they wouldn't even sell them to us because they said they would they were too small right and this this gentleman from me tractor told me yesterday he said if, if you was getting a boom on an M5000, he said you needed to put it on at least a 6000 series M model. He said do not put a boom on a 5000. And judge, I mean, 
I don't want to take up a lot of time, but one reason why this tractor is is good, and I do recommend it, it may be just a, a six inches wider in the in the width of the machine, but that machine you can bring that boom around directly behind the rear tire and uh, and mow with it behind the machine. So as long as that machine fits on the road, you can mow the road. It, it, is this going to take care of our tractor problem? The ones we're ordering today. For now, but you're going to need. How many two. more are we going to have to have? At least two more. Three. Are we going to have this problem again when we order, if we don't order right now? That's what we're ordering. Let's just go ahead and. We so we're talking go. about further on down, for on down this year. Let's get these done and let's see what CMI says. We might need to order another one for spring. Well, I'm just saying, if, if that's what we need to do, we need to go ahead and get an order in so we won't be without a tractor coming. That's what the guy from me told me. He said, you need to go ahead and get on the list because there's so many counties and states that's getting on the list now that if you don't get on the list, Let's, maybe further way down the road getting them even into 2022. Well, what I would recommend we do and maybe wait to see where we're at financially in the fall. And then, you know, we can get on it pretty quick. I mean, they give us... I mean, they give you eight, nine months lead time if we wait to September, October, just to get an idea of where we are. Did we get those other tractors back to the garage today? Yes. How well, they didn't, they didn't go to the garage. They were one was just out. a hose but yep. burst or something, and they fixed it. Yep. So we, let's do this. We got a motion a second. Any other question on this purchase? So we get the PO done today and uh, author it. Let me restate the motion. The motion to purchase these two in authorization. Well, we wouldn't need to do the check now, would we? Okay, it's fine. So, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. All right. Um, are you all. I mean, do you want to go ahead and just put our name on the list for another tractor too? Judge, I think we need to do that. I mean, is there a motion to authorize? This is a special meeting. I don't know if we can do that or not. Uh, we've got this potential. Well, no, it's it's on here. I think we're good. A discussion and potential purchase of mowers. So that's we can do that. Is there a motion to go ahead and uh, authorize? Come on up, Greg. When Greg's motion, that means he's need to say something. I think I think one of the biggest things is we're we're actually not buying these mowers from a John Deere dealer. We are buying them uh, from an Alamo dealer. Um, I think the Alamo dealer has a steady flow of tractors on order coming in, especially since these are the exact same tractors that the state of Tennessee uses for their highway department. So I don't see us having a you know 10 or 12 month delay from an order if we order from a company like Alamo opposed to order a John Deere order trying to put in order to order tractors so I well, think you know I, I'll, I'll have some further guy, discussion with him about that guy from Mead which you might want to reach out to Mead tractors I mean Fabian knows as well as I do Mead's a big tractor dealership John Deere and does the guy out of Georgetown me tractor told me yesterday that he deals with diamond and alamo and all of them he checked with them they didn't have no tractor for they order tractors they can order john deere tractors and put on there but he told me him a dealer big john deere dealers they are he said i need at least if i was going to buy one you need at least seven to nine months lead time on these tractors he said that right now he said diamond is 10 months out on getting some of their mowers so so let's do this Mower. We got another court meeting next week or week after. Let Greg do what he needs to do and check with, and see about what the lead time he can call me. I know who we ain't calling. We're not calling the place in Bowling Green uh, that we talked to uh, that we ordered the other ones from. I just don't want to get in this problem. We have this problem again next year. Well, that's why we'll ho hopefully be able to get something lined up. Let's figure out what the lead times are. And then I get we a can, price from me. They may. He could have a good price on or something. But he told me that I need to get on the list now. Well, we'll check. When we're going to check. Always check the prices. But that's what Greg can get. He can call them this week and check with whoever else. I'll do that. All right. That will give us a little time to see how 
once we get these other mowers in. Greg, you and, how, and if is three really going to be enough to do what we want to do? I don't think it is. I don't know. Oh, it's not. I know. I know that it's I think not. you need at least two more, don't you? Fred? Two more. But I tell you something else. You're going to have to look at. Yeah. You're going to have to look at something else. You're going to have to. We're going to have to look at our pay scale for CDL drivers and equipment operators. And that's true. Fabian brought up a good a good point yesterday. The mowers have always been, and I'll just bring this out right. The mowers have always been the lowest paid job in the road department. But yet you're putting them on a hundred and thirty thousand dollar piece of equipment. I agree, Judge. Right. So yeah. I mean, there's a lot of structural issues. <coughs> but when you start adjusting your pay to where you can compete with the private sector, and we've got you know folks from the newspaper here, and they'll fully agree with this. Government entities aren't like the private sector. I mean, we're constrained because the only way the government gets money is taxes. In this court, again, I think we agreed that there's not going to be tax increases, and. Uh, that's why, you know, it's somewhat shocking to see some of these special governmental entities sitting there with millions of dollars, not just here, but across the state. And that's money that's coming directly from the taxpayers. So, um, bleeding the taxpayers dry. Well, it, it does. And, you know, I mean, you could go look on the tax ticket of what I'm paying at my house. I mean, I've got it, you know, I mean, people are paying a lot of money to these special entities and, you know, there's got to be some level of accountability for that. So we'll address the mowers. Greg can have some prices for us at the next court meeting on potentially what we're going to do in the spring. So, Greg, do you have anything else? No, that's all. But just, you know, whatever we buy, whether we buy it, we'll either get governmental pricing or co-op pricing. So, you know, the pricing should be right. But, yes, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll check with he, a lot of vendors. He also told me yesterday that – I guess it's the build of the tractor, but he said the M series is harder to get than the E series. Because of the frame? Right, the uh, M series tractor is a full rail frame, solid rail frame, where the uh, E series tractor is kind of an economy tractor. It's a bolt together frame. Ideally, for an arm and a mower like that, it would be ideally it'd be put on an M series mower. Of course, if you get the same size tractor that we just bought in an M series, it's going to be quite a bit more expensive. No, I think it's we need to stay with he that size tractor. He got the booms on the E series better than he did the M series. Who did? The guy from Meat Tractor. Why is that? He said it's a bigger built tractor. It's a big machine. He said the bigger the tractor, that's the reason he said on the M you didn't want to go with the five thousand, you wanted to go with the six thousand. The bigger built tractor, the better it would handle the frame. I mean the boom, you know. The but when you go from an E series to an M series, you're talking. Yeah. Tens of thousands of dollars more, probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars a unit. That's grade. the reason he suggested to me if we did go with the M series to go with the six thousand series and not go with the five thousand. And that gets cost prohibitive really quick. I mean, you're talking one hundred sixty or seventy thousand a tractor probably if you go to the M series because the tractor alone was a hundred and some thousand, Greg. Yeah. But if you buy that good of a tractor, though, you're not as apt to have problems. Out of your tractor. Well, your maintenance should be. Air, air maintenance costs at the garage have continued to go down. Frankie, is that a fair statement? We're saving the taxpayers massive sums of money by not throwing, continually throwing money at junk. Right. And not going to the state surplus auction and buying junk. You're going to, you know, we've had to make some hard decisions to be able to afford new equipment, and it's limited our ability to do a lot of things. But you can't do the work without, it doesn't do you any good if you had twice the number of people if you got nothing to work with. That's great. So, I mean, we got to find that balance between the optimal number of employees and the equipment that we can afford to, better, to allow them to do their job. But I think if, C, if CMI and, and me both said if they was buying the M series, they'd go with the 6,000. I think you should go with the well, But this E series, though, is, is, I'm, I'm, it's, it's proved out to be a, a good. A good machine. I mean, I mean we're not going to be, I mean, all they're going to be doing is mowing with these tractors. It ain't like they're going to be pulling stumps and, you know. Well, his whole problem was, was boom. Yeah. You know, that's Wait the reason he suggested going with that size tractors on account of the boom. He said, if you want the 18 foot boom or 22 foot boom, he said, you need to either put it on the M6000 or go to the E series. Right, but he did include the E series in yes, that. And that's what we bought. And that's okay. what we bought. Right. We, Aris is E6. Oh, he highly recommended the E series with okay. the booms. E6000 is what we got. We, we got an E6105. That's a 6000 series. So. Yeah. All right. Fabian, do we have uh, 
the the mower truck that goes around with the mowers mm -hmm. do we have an air compressor in that truck no we don't we do not have air compressor in it well I honestly Frank, I mean, it, it's something we probably ought to look at because those tractors they'll pull that grass and straw in that radiator all the time yeah. every day they really need to be blowed out that's uh, i mean be, i'm just saying no, that that no, save us some I, trouble down the road if we, i have to blow mine out i mean yeah that, yeah yeah i agree and i mean you need to keep a close eye they, or they need to keep a close eye on their air filters and stuff yeah yeah i had I've, i have to do that every time i cut but, the, but the, we need to check on that, and if we do find him an air compressor to put in their gasoline or something where he, they can blow those tractors out every day or every morning before they start. Okay. I use a leaf blower to blow mine out. It works pretty good. Well, we can try that, Judge. That's what I use is leaf blower. We can try, try a leaf blower. It's easier to pull an air compressor out. It's not going to blow the filters out that much, the air filter, but, you know. It gets the... Also, be handy if you had a tire issue while you were out gone. You know, you'd have a compressor there. Just thinking if he had one of those on there, if they have a flat tire, if they run over something, he might get them back in or somewhere where they can park it and stuff like that. But it'd be it'd be good to be able to blow that radiator out every day. He also told me on them air conditioning units. Be, be sure to keep that air conditioner filter kept clean in them units because if they get dirty cause your air conditioner to go down quicker. If you keep a good clean filter, he said in the air conditioner unit, your air conditioner will last longer in that tractor. As far as where they do all that mold and stuff, it's gonna get clogged up quicker and cause, could cause damage to your air conditioner unit. Right. So they need to keep that filter in the air conditioner unit. Mm We do have one matter um, before we come back. I'm sure the members of the court have some stuff they would like to add. We have one personnel matter. Mr. Downey, please instruct the public on the relevant provisions of the Kentucky Open Meeting Law as it pertains to entry into executive session. And uh, for, the, for those who are here, including Mr. Vanderbeck, we won't be in there, but just four or five minutes. Please proceed, sir. Kentucky Revised Statute 61.810 allows you to go into executive session to discuss proposed or pending litigation under paragraph C and under paragraph F to discuss specific personnel matters. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Tackett. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Booth. Any, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. We will be in recess uh, for a few minutes for executive session. Thank you. We'll call the court back to order. We have an absent member who just walked in. Uh, is there a motion to uh, adjourn from executive session? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Robertson. Second by? Second by Booth. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Uh, I'd like to ask uh, just briefly if Mr. Rexel Nee Jackson could come up here to the desk. And uh, we have an announcement to make that I think is a very positive thing for the people of this county. Uh, nee, welcome. And um, I know a lot about you. I've known you for a long time. <coughs> Uh, and he is the um, fire chief at Belfry, was a former uh, safety director here for the fiscal court until they um, did away with that position for uh, a number of years. And with the impending retirement of Doug Tackett, who I've always said is one of the best emergency management directors in Kentucky, um, Doug is retiring and uh, we approached knee about uh, taking this position upon Doug's retirement in um, in the winter. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, when Doug retires that uh, 
the person that steps in there is qualified, they have all the certifications, and they fully understand the implications of the job. And, Nee, I think with your working with emergency management and rescue and the fire service and EMS, that you understand more than anyone how important the emergency management director job is. Uh, when we had the train derailment, you were up there for that. You have done everything from swift water rescues to um, uh, motor vehicle collisions, ATV cl accidents, and there's a lot of things that can happen, whether it's a pandemic or whatever, and of all the people in this county that I think could be a true, uh, truly excel as the emergency, emergency management director and, and fill the big shoes that Doug Tackett uh, has, has, is going to vacate there. I think you're the person. So it would be my motion to approve hiring uh, Nee Jackson as Deputy Emergency Management Director at a 5A rate of pay, effective 8 15 21, uh, to work under Doug for a period of about five or six months to get all your certifications, to be trained up fully, and be able to step into that position uh, permanently, uh, probably January, early February. So it would be my motion uh, as stated. Is there a second? Second. We have a second by Commissioner Booth. Would you like to address the court or say anything, sir? I'd just, uh, first of all, like to thank you all for um, having a confidence in me, uh, offering uh, the chance to, uh, to do the job. Um, Doug, uh, as I've mentioned to you before, he's probably the best in the state. Uh, it's a really big shoes to fill, but, um, you know, I'll, do, I'll do, the, do the best job that I can, and, um, do what's best for the people of Pike County. Well, I think you bring a lot more to the table than just your experience. I think that your moral values, your integrity, um, people don't may not know you've served on the school board now. I guess you're in your second term as a member of the Pike County Board of Education. Obviously, you'll have to vacate that position. That's a big loss for the school board, but it's our gain, the gain for the, the people throughout the county. You also serve as a deacon at, I guess, First Baptist Church and uh, I know your whole family. You've raised a great, two great girls, and uh, you've got a wife that's just a, one of the finest people you'll ever meet. And we're just excited that you're they're willing to do this for the people. And I know it's a uh, leaving the private sector. It's it's probably not going to be as financially lucrative, but um, I know how much you love emergency management and uh, the fire service. I think you'll be a great liaison between the court and the fire service because. Uh, we have worked hard to maintain the ISO funding and to help our fire departments, um, and we look forward to working with you. So um, with that being said, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll all. see you August 15th. All right. You might want to get with uh, William and with Justin to get the paperwork done so you'll be all, everybody, everything will be ready to go. Uh, on 815 you just walk in start work thank you all thank Appreciate you sir it. thank you all right uh mr little anything sir no. all right colonel downey we've uh we'll talk anything from you sir no, judge. all right judge hickman anything no, sir. all right this time i'd like to ask commissioner uh, tackett you have anything you'd like to say judge uh, i just i mean i this library thing it's I've had a lot of, I've got some family members that's been libraries in the school system and stuff like this, but this is a different world, what's out here. I mean, to help Pikeville College grow, and they're not willing to work with it, I don't, I just, I don't agree with that. I mean, it's a, the nursing program could bring a lot more jobs to something that just, you know, just drive by and tell me cars is in there, how many people's there every day. The interactive could be there with the nursing program just we just need to work what we can do with on our end of it i think thank you sir that's all i've got mr roberts anything uh, the library is a good thing for pike county but when they spend 11 million dollars on a new building and you can go by there and you don't see very very many cars there that makes you question some things and then they go out and buy a piece of property behind the building for four hundred and fifteen thousand dollars 
that I don't think a car has ever been parked on. It's bad enough that they're taxing the people of Pike County, but when they can't help the University of Pikeville with their nursing program to expand and create more jobs in Pike County, that's just not, that's not the right way to do things. We've all got to work together to keep this county afloat, keep our people here working, and make people want to stay here. And I just urge the library board to look at this again and try to, to help University of Pipeville create this nursing program to be larger and they will be hired at this Pipeville Medical Center. We don't have nurses there now. They're short of nurses. But, and I urge all the citizens of Pike County to support this physical court and what we're questioning the library to do. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boo. And Judge, I have to agree with Ronnie on that. I just, I, I think that the library board should support the University of Pike for this. I think that uh, whenever you're spending 400 some thousand dollars on a lot that you just mow, and then you've got a building up at Justiceville that I guess that's what she claims they make furniture out of it or whatever. I weld, just, they weld there. Weld there. I, I don't know. That's just I didn't know the library was into doing something like that, Judge. I just. But anyway, I just I think that the, the library board should reconsider and look at this very strong. And anybody that has in this county that knows anybody on the library or board should influence them or call them and ask them that they support the University of Pikeville. I mean, when you've got two libraries with less than what four mile apart three mile apart I'd say it's and I think that, lives. you know one library should be plenty I mean everybody uses the internet now I know I do I really want if I need to know something I get on Google and look it up see where you know what I need information Amazon I need. yeah so uh same way I done when I was curious about meat tractor I got on there and googled it and found out the information and called them so I didn't go to no library for anything but the second thing I have is uh, he should, uh, I should ask Nate to spoke on this a little bit. We'll be having our 4th of July fireworks show. Let's sit down by the Southside Ball, July 3rd, 10.05, shoot off time. Anybody wants to come down and see a good fireworks show, come over at Belfry, sit beside the forward line, enjoy the fireworks. Thank you, sir. And the Belfry Fire Department puts that on every year. They do a fantastic job. So I just want to Miller briefly. does a good job too, Judge. I want to throw them in there too. Miller spends a whole lot of time and money on the fireworks up at the fish trap too. Um, we encourage people to get out now that the pandemic restrictions are lifted. I, I, I do. I want to follow up on this library board issue. And this, I have publicly stated many times that it was a tremendous benefit for me to grow up across the street from the Vesta Roberts Johnson Memorial Library. I grew up right across the street. I love to read about military history and politics and and it was but things have changed i mean you know i grew up in the 19 or, you know the 1980s I, baby and i graduated from high school in 87. there was no internet in 1987. there was no uh the technology didn't exist in 1987. and it was even more primitive when commissioner robertson graduated thank you thank <laughs> thank you judge appreciate that i just wondered if he was paying attention and things change i mean is the way technology um is advancing uh it's it's mind-boggling how things have changed in the last 20 or 30 years and another 20 or 30 years uh you know a lot of companies through the pandemic have realized that they don't need huge huge brick and mortar buildings and they can cut their overhead by allowing people to work remotely and that's one of the reasons broadband's important. Now, there are some people that don't have access to broadband. But by and large, if you're in downtown Pikeville, that's not likely going to be the case. If you've got a cell phone, you're going to have access to, to data. Um, very few places in the county don't have access to Internet. And we do need to maintain a healthy library system, but it also needs to take into account 
the burden that's placed on the taxpayers in the long-term future of this county. You know, growing up here and living through the transformation from a coal-based economy to an economy that's still in, in change, it's in a state of flux because we don't know where the economy is going to end up. We're trying to develop tourism. No one would have ever believed when Fabian Little and I graduated from high school 34 years ago that there would be a medical school in Pikeville. I mean, that would have been something that was inconceivable. One of only 21 optometry schools in the United States of America located in Pikeville, Kentucky. Now, you Pike, Pikeville College, my granddad graduated from Pikeville College, my mother-in-law, my wife went to medical school there, her sister went to medical school there. That university has done more for this area than any other single institution in the history of the region. They've educated teachers, nurses, doctors, dentists. Now they have an MBA program. A lot of people have gotten their bachelor's degree there and moved on to other things. That university is something, and I said it in the last court meeting, that every other county in central Appalachia would love to have. Do you think Floyd County wouldn't like to have an optometry and medical school in a massive, you know, the, the, a $60 million university sitting in the middle of Prestonsburg or Whitesburg or Paintsville. And it, to me, seems very, very uh, short-sighted to stand in the way of tripling the nursing program that would immediately, we can put probably 200 people to work right now in Pike County at jobs of more than 50000 a year easily if we had people, if, there, if, there were, if, if they were available. In two years, you could be turning out triple the number of nurses. Those people will be staying here, making good money, paying occupational taxes, paying property taxes, and raising their families here. And I told a story to uh, Terry Dawson when we were talking um, about a couple years ago, my mother-in-law, my kids, my wife and I, we stopped up at the little gas station there at the top of Pound Mountain. Um, somebody had to stop for some reason. And uh, when you travel with three kids, you understand what I'm talking about. And there was two pickup trucks out front of the gas pumps, and they were loaded with furniture. And when we go in, my mother-in-law recognizes the uh, young man that was driving one of the trucks loaded with furniture as one of her former students at Pike Central. And his wife and children were with him, and they were, his wife was driving the other truck. And she said, you know, how are you doing? He hugged her. And he said, well, he said, I've been laid off three times in the last two years in the mining industry, and I've just had enough. We're moving to, to uh, Tennessee. I found a job in a factory around Morristown or Dandridge or somewhere. That is a common story. Go to, um, go to, to Georgetown. Look at the number of people that have left. Our population in 1980 was 81,000 people. It will shock me if it's, if it's not below 53,000 when the census numbers come out in August or September. I read a, an article here a few court meetings ago that was in the old Pike County Times, Jeff. That, that was the predecessor to the News Express. and There was a story in 1977 that there was a study done by the University of Louisville uh, Department of uh, Urban Planning or Urban Studies or something like I think it was urban planning, that they projected in 2020 that Pike County's population would be 147,000 people. And look at what's changed. I mean, they thought in 1977 we would be sitting here with 147,000 people and we're going to be a lot closer to 47,000 than 147,000. And the coal industry changed dramatically with mechanization and the loss of jobs. And now we've seen what's happened with the move away to cleaner energy, uh, less demand for, for, for coal-generated uh, power. If we can't find a way to stop people from leaving eastern Kentucky, it's going to continue to see power rates increase, water rates increase, other utilities 
to increase because you've got fewer people to share the cost of it. You're going to have fewer people to pay taxes to take care of our county roads, our county infrastructure. You're going to have fewer people to support our fire departments, our senior citizen centers, our sheriff's office, our police departments. And at some point, the quality of life is jeopardized to the point where even more people are going to leave. That's why we held a firm line on taxes. But when you see a library district uh, sitting there with $6 million in the bank and with payroll and fringe benefits of, I think, around, what we say, $2.5 million or so, um, it raises questions. I mean, things have changed since I used to go to the library across from my house. Uh, with iPads and laptops and cell phones, the need for libraries has changed. doesn't mean that they're not important, but the people of the county have to ask, how many libraries can we afford? But I think there's a fundamental question. How could the library board justify spending somewhere, and I want to submit to the people, probably closer to 12 million between the building for 10.8 million. And if she said they, I think she said they scaled it down. I mean, I don't know what they had planned to build, but a $10.8 million building with $400,000 lot behind it, plus I was told a few minutes ago, $400,000 in furniture to furnish it. Why did we need that? You know, that is a massive investment of taxpayer money. And I do question that whether there was a need for that kind of expenditure in light of the economic circumstance, circumstances facing Eastern Kentucky and Pike County in particular. In particular due to the fact that since 2012, coal and mineral service has plummeted from 12.4 million to 1.1 million. Now this court has done the same exact work with less people and $11 million plus in less revenue from coal and mineral service. And even if you add the occupational net profit tax in, you're still roughly 8 million short of where you were a decade ago. And I don't think anyone would believe that things haven't gone up. Everybody recognizes that in the last nine years, soon to be 10 years, everything has gotten more expensive. Our insurance, our employee, uh, cost of employees, pay, uh, pension costs, uh, equipment for our road lot and solid waste. We really are going to have to look at what, what we're going to prioritize, and I think that we have to start with looking at the library board. The reality is uh, we're not here with 81,000 people. We're not here with you know thousands of people employed in the coal industry any longer. And the one positive that we have, the University of Pikeville, uh, one of the positives, we need to do everything we can to help it grow. When Terry Dotson told me that when he came onto the board at the University of Pikeville back in the 1990s, that the um, budget for the university was four million dollars when he became chairman i think in 1995 or so the budget for upike was around 12 million dollars it's now 60 million dollars just with what the university generates and spends 60 million dollars and there's people working there that doesn't count the money that the students and the faculty are turning over in our community um, so I, I think that I would be remiss if I didn't advocate for something that could help Pike County and Pikeville in the entire region as much as the university being able to triple the nursing school. I think Fabian Little's daughter would testify to that, the impact it's had on her life, Greg Fannin's daughter, Ronnie Robertson's wife and, and daughter. Uh, you know, uh, Judge Hickman's wife was director of nursing at Pikeville Medical Center, and I think she's the epitome of what a nurse should be. But those are, are desperately needed jobs, and they're good paying jobs. And um, I'm going to continue to advocate for trying to help create jobs here, and I know this court is too. So thank you all very much. Anything else to come before the court today? Is there a motion? Before we have a motion to adjourn, Commissioner Booth, would you say the benediction for us? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you again, dear Lord, Lord, watch over us all as we travel to our homes, dear Heavenly Father, and Lord, watch over us as the holidays come up, as all of us will be traveling on the roads, and just put your protective hand up over us, dear Heavenly Father, and until we meet this another time, dear Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah.
Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Tack. Is there a second? Second. Who made the motion? Was it Commissioner Roberts? <laughs> was it Commissioner Tackett? Commissioner Booth with a second? All right, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. We are adjourned.